So hi. Hi. To start off with, would you like to say your name and where you are? Yeah, my name is uh, Dr. Ronald Alexander and I'm in Santa Monica, California. Okay, well, nice to meet you. Nice to and meet the, you. And uh, the first big question for you is, uh, who are you? Who are you as a human being, as a person? And that can be, you know, qualities, values, interests, passions, whatever you'd like. Um, well, talking about myself, um, I'm certainly an adventurer and a pioneer. Um, in 1970, I was an undergraduate at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, and a guy in a wheelchair came into our dorm, and his name was Chris Palamas, and he was a, a former uh, wrestler on the Wesleyan uh, College wrestling team in Connecticut, and he said that he had just spent three years with someone named Fritz Pearls out at Esalen. And he was looking for volunteers to participate in a Gestalt therapy group. And I didn't know what Gestalt was, but it sounded interesting. And so um, I enrolled in the group and he would come twice a week. He'd drive up from Connecticut and um, he would run the group in our dorm. And so it was the same time in life and history where I was also got introduced to being a mountaineer. And so I started climbing some of the tallest mountains in North and South America. Uh, you're in Durango, Mexico. I'm sure you've heard, heard of Popocatepetl. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we did a mountain climbing expedition that very same year with a group of us. Some of us were in that Gestalt group and uh, some of the folks weren't. And so I've been an adventurer, uh, a world traveler. I'm someone that, um, in addition to getting involved in Gestalt in 1970, I also got involved in Zen Buddhism and uh, Kundalini Yoga and Ashtanga Yoga. And so I've spent a lot of time uh, both in the West practicing psychotherapy, but also alternating my time between being in Asia, uh, Japan, uh, Bali, Thailand, India, um, and studying meditation, studying various systems of yoga. Um, and then I spent a lot of time, about a third of the year in Europe, usually doing trainings and teaching and enjoying the European culture. So. Okay. And out of all of those different aspects of your life, would you say that there are any particular values or principles that you sort of orient around? Um, the most important value I think that I operate around is integrity and truth, um, being a very early explorer of spirituality and mystical systems. Everything is really about uh, seeking for the truth, and living the truth and finding the truth. So I would say I'm somebody who's very truth and uh, integrity driven. Uh, it's really important um, to live from a place of truth, telling the truth, um, acting in truth. And then whenever I don't wanna tell the truth on not acting in truth, I usually say, I don't wanna answer that question. <laughs> no, okay, you plead the fifth. <laughs> plead the fifth. Um, but I'm also, I think, really driven by the value of curiosity and mm -hmm. creative imagination. Um, mm -hmm. When I was 15 years old, I joined a band in Boston um, with two of my high school chums who were eminently, extraordinarily gifted musicians. I think I was just kind of a ordinary guitar player and singer, but they were really, truly uh, just in a class of their own. And so I spent a lot of time in my early life studying music, playing music, being with really gifted musicians and it had a profound effect and influence on my career as a Gestalt therapist, my career as a professor, um, and my career as a consultant and a trainer and in the last 15 years as a creativity coach, mm. and leadership coach. Okay, but well, definitely sounds like uh, quite a rich variety of experiences. 
Yeah. So I, I'm kind of looking forward to the story that might come out when I ask it, what event or circumstance that you've experienced in your life comes to mind as something that has really impacted or changed or shaped you significantly? Well, there have been so many. Um, I would say the most profound event was participating in that first, very first Gestalt therapy group. Um, I had been in a variation of um, a Sullivanian postmodern um, form of psychoanalysis uh, at the university for the year before, where I would go and see this therapist who was really trained analytically. But because he was a Sullivanian, he was from the interpersonal school. And so his office was in his house. His name was Dr. Norm Simonson. He was the chair of the psychology department at the University of Massachusetts. And I was in a lot of pain. I was depressed. I had a lot of anxiety. And he only charged me $5 a session. And he was just like, preeminent head of the psychology department. Uh, he had a PhD, um, eminently gifted, written many, many books and publications. And when he asked me how much I thought I could pay, I, I said, I'm just so embarrassed, but you know, I don't really have any money. I'm a struggling student. How's $5? And he didn't miss a beat. And um, that was very impactful and put, profoundly influenced me that he was really doing it out of the genuine interest in helping and healing. And I took that with me throughout my entire career and you know, have always remembered that sometimes you just give it away um, and it comes back tenfold. So I would say joining that Gestalt group in Amherst. And then I also would say profound impact on me was I met these two Zen Buddhist Quakers. And I know it's a strange combination, but they were Zen Buddhists, they were Quakers, and one of them was Teresina Havens and she used to be the chair of the uh, Buddhist studies department at Yale, and then she came up to Amherst. And then her husband was the uh, very preeminent um, religious psychologist who studied with uh, Fritz Kunkel, who was here in LA um, in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. And he, Joseph Havens, Teresina's husband, um, he was involved at Harvard with the Leary and Alpert and Metzner research project on psychedelics, mm -hmm. LSD and psilocybin. And so I met them when I was 19 years old um, and they took me under their uh, thumb and they really wanted to mentor me. And um, they were in the, their, see, Joe was in his late fifties and she was in her early eighties. Mm -hmm. And I would have these mentoring sessions, you know, e each with them separately, but I'll just tell you about the profound sessions with Teresina. I would come to her farmhouse up on Main Street, which was about five miles from the university. And let's say the uh, mentoring session was at three o'clock. And so we would go out into her garden and we would pull weeds and we would plant and we would harvest things and we would talk. And she would ask me um, to talk about myself. She would ask me like, straight up questions. How are you feeling today? And if I would just say, oh, fine or good, she'd say things like, well, I, I really would prefer that you dig a little more deeply and tell me what's really going on with you so that we can have a real encounter, a dialogue. Because mm -hmm. they were also, I found out later that they had been trained in Gestalt therapy also. So they wanted a real dialogue. They didn't just want, how are you? I'm good, I'm fine. And, that really helped to forge um, things like transparency and engaged contact, 
uh, honest and true dialogue or dialogic ex exchange. And second, they, after we would work in the garden for a couple of hours, we would come in and then we'd cook dinner from scratch together. Um, and then she'd say, uh, how about we sit and meditate? And so that's where I learned to my first, first line of study with Zen Buddhism. Um, so back in 1970, I was one of the really beginning baby teachers of mindfulness. Um, hmm. which didn't explode until like 2004, 2005. And, you know, I published my first book on um, wise mind, open mind on mindfulness. It's called wise mind, open mind, finding purpose and meaning in times of crisis, loss and change in 2009. And I would have to really attribute the, the very early uh, mentor-mentee relationships and conversations that we had over a course of a couple of years um, with both her and with her husband separately um, is being really formative, kind of shaping. So? Um, because it really shaped my character. Um, they were really about no bullshit, you know, tell us what's really happening with yourself. If you're depressed, say you're depressed. If you're anxious, you're anxious. If you're happy, you're happy. Um, and they also were very instrumental in opening the door at that time in history to some experimentation with psychedelic uh, and psychoactive substances because mm -hmm. they were both involved in the uh, study at Harvard University. And so through them, I then met another very, very important mentor, Dr. Daniel P. Brown, who is still at the uh, Harvard uh, Medical School. And he and I have had a relationship for over 45 years and extremely influential in, in terms of understanding altered states of consciousness, understanding attachment theory. I've studied hypnoanalysis and hypnotherapy with him uh, on and off over the last 40 years. I've studied at Harvard Medical programs and um, on mindfulness and, and peak performance. And I would say those three in my uh, council of support as an undergraduate, and then if you put in the Gestalt therapist, Chris, and those four people had a tremendous uh, impact on, on me and how I developed as a person and then how I developed uh, professionally. And I'm, I'm wondering if there's a particular moment that comes to mind, a, I mean, I imagine like the, the circumstances of the garden conversations and the dinners, but is there, is there a particular moment that you would say this, this word, this conversation, this moment changed me in some way? Or is it sort of a series of gradual processes? Well, there's a series of gradual transitions, but the biggest change I would say is in 1994, I was in India and I was, asked if I wanted to take a, um, a sunset cruise in a small boat between the boatman and myself, where you go out uh, into the river Ganges. And Varanasi is the sacred and ancient city. It used to be called Banaras. Um, and it's the ancient city of where it's very auspicious. People from all over India, they want to go there to die um, oh. because it's considered uh, a sacred rite of passage to die in Benares and to be cremated there. And so one night um, I was invited into the boat and we were going through uh, the fog to get out into the middle uh, of the river where you look back and you see all these temples and all these, they're called ghats. Um, there's one to like 11 ghats and we were in the first three of the ghats and the ghats are the places where they uh, cremate people and then they push their ashes into the water. Mm -hmm. And there was a point where we were heading out and about halfway through um, getting to the center of the river, the kind of fog cleared up. And then I had this experience it, as if the fog inside of myself had lifted. And like, there's a saying, um, Adolf Huxley had it in his uh, Doors of Perception and he borrowed it from William Blake. 
in where William Blake says, when the doors of perception are cleansed, everything appears as it is in infinite. And so there was this profound experience of just experiencing the outer and the inner fog receding. And then I had this kind of pristine experience of uh, realization of really feeling like I had just began to wake up and to see everything from a, a different plane of consciousness, one with great clarity. And that was pretty profound. And then mm -hmm. um, on that same trip at the, I write about this in, in my book, um, the very last chapter. So I was traveling all over India for many months and I was really searching and looking for enlightenment and um, looking for some great master to study with. And uh, every profound master I met, uh, they always asked, they asked me the same question. And after that experience, they would say, do you have, do you have any questions? And there's a saying in Zen that in order to open yourself up, you have to empty yourself. And so every time I, I would meet a master, they would ask me the same question. Do you have any questions? And I would say, my, like my brain would go blank because I didn't. Mm -hmm. And so then they, they would say, well, you, there's nothing that, you know, we don't have any karma because um, unless you have questions, there's nothing for us to do. And so mm -hmm. one of them suggested that I head on to uh, Bodh Gaya, which is where the Mahabodhi temple is. And that's where the Buddha was enlightened. It was like there were seven spaces around uh, Bodh Gaya where he sat. One was in the river, one was up in a cave, one was in the forest. And so his last place was under this Bodhi tree. And so I was told to, uh, by the Tibetan monks to go and to sit there from four to seven in the morning and that something very uh, special would occur. So I was hell bent on, oh, that's where I'm gonna experience enlightenment. And so I, was, I went there and it was freezing cold and it was in January and um, I'm meditating, my meditation is perfect. And uh, about quarter of seven, I, I start to feel like the, like little acorns are being tossed at me. And then I hear the laughter of children. And then I start to feel that my hair is being pulled and then flowers are being thrown at me. And so I open my eyes, you know, cause, and I'm feeling like, okay, I'm quarter of seven, I'm, I'm right there, I'm, I'm about to be enlightened. You know, <laughs> one eye and this like 25 little Tibetan kids and they're playing with me. And then I just burst into this experience of like joyous humor. Like here it is, I think that I'm sitting here so holy, still, and what do I get? That the message is play with the kids. You get the laughing Buddha. <laughs> I get the laughing Buddha. And I just couldn't stop laughing and laughing. And I think I laughed for the whole, the rest of the month in India that, um, wow, okay. And that's really what it is, you know, because being in the moment and that's what showed up and all these little kids. And we played for like about an hour and I gave them chocolate bars and pencils because when you travel in India, it's important to have things to give, give away. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was uh, profoundly uh, touching, but also uh, very joyful. Hmm. And I, I ask this next question. I sometimes ask people about it. I sometimes don't, especially when I'm speaking, you know, with white guys over 50. Um, I'm curious about how you understand yourself in the world in terms of privilege or power or who you are in relation to, you know, all of these other places and people. And I, I say no. this respectfully. I mean, I don't sure. assume anything about you. Yeah. I, I would have to answer it in two parts because this who I am today at age 70. And I would say that it, as a white male, highly educated, highly professionally trained, published with lots of publications. And I've taught at some very prestigious universities like UCLA, Pepperdine University, Pacifica Graduate Institute, 
um, lectured at John Hopkins Medical School and on and on and on that, um, oh, and that I've had a successful private practice. And as I said, consulting and leadership coaching and teaching at university. So who I am today, I would say very privileged. I mean, as a white guy, you know, if I had been born um, in another body in from another race, uh, I don't know. So I'm incredibly thankful. Um, oftentimes at night when I'm sitting in my hot tub in my Zen home up in the Santa Monica mountains, uh, overlooking the ocean, gated in with skylights and fireplaces, I say to the cosmos, you know, I have these two giant pine trees and oak trees. I usually say, I'm just so thankful. I am so grateful, Cosmos. I know I've worked really hard to get here, but I'm really grateful that you gave me so many wonderful blessings and so many wonderful opportunities. Now, part two is let's go back in time though. Um, I wasn't born into privilege. I was born um, in a lower class, one of 10 children in a very economically poor um, environment in Boston, Irish. And in the 50s and 60s, you know, if you were Irish it, in Boston, it, it, it was sort of like Irish, the Italians, uh, the Blacks, and the Puerto Ricans. You know, you were kind of looked down on. And then being one of 10 children, not much privilege because we barely had enough money. I mean, my father was an executive at AT&T for 45 years, but he, the kind of money he made if he had two children, we would have had a life of luxury. Right. But with 10 children, because they were Catholics, and at that point in history, they believed in the nonsense of birth control. Um, he was a guy that you know worked 14 hours a day, sometimes six, seven days a week, he could never get ahead. Right. And so I didn't have any privilege um, growing up. You know, I had to really fight and scratch and claw my way onto every athletic team to become an Eagle Boy Scout, to be, um, to attend college. I had to go to junior college first because I couldn't afford a four year school. And then junior college, I had such great grades that I uh, got scholarships at two different universities. Um, and so the beginning of my life, I, I would say not a lot of white privilege. White, but not a lot of privilege. I mean, I, I would say our socioeconomic background was up there with a lot of minorities. And uh, we, were, we were shamed, we were humiliated because we had 10 kids. You know, anytime we showed up in a station wagon, there were, it was a very, um, there was two parts of Boston, there was the richer Irish neighborhood and then the poor. And we would be shamed, you know, 10 children, da 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 da. So early life, very little privilege. Mm -hmm. But after I say finished graduate school, yeah, I've been extremely um, blessed mm -hmm. to have had a lot of privilege. And I guess being white and being a male, um, not many doors were ever shut to me. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and I, you know, it, it, if there was a choice between me and somebody, some other faculty member, I, I usually got hired. Mm -hmm. I usually got the nod. Um, the only place I didn't get the nod was in a few Gestalt institutes, but that's a whole other <laughs> story of politics that's, that's... that if you want to get into later, you can get into that. But, um, yeah. Gestalt <laughs> politics, um, it was very, very difficult to navigate. That was sort of like my early life. Mm -hmm. it's, it's always got a life of its own, doesn't it? So yeah. an, another question that I do have to, to get into the, the gestalt -y part, maybe less in the Gestalt politics, but okay. um, before I go there, is specifically how you experience or have come to understand yourself in your gender or in your masculinity or as a man. If that's been part of something that you've been exploring consciously? I don't think 
I've consciously explored it. Um, I think that as I've aged and people have from all ages and all genders have sought my counsel, um, I've come to appreciate and respect that I think, and maybe some people will take issue with this, I think it's a lot easier to be a male navigating through a male dominated world than it used to be for a female. I don't think many people would take issue with that. It sounds kind of like a statement of fact. Yeah. And um, in when I was chair of a psychology department and director of a clinical training, um, I would stack it. And at times, in some of the years, there would be far more female trainers than male trainers. And I grew up with six sisters and three brothers. And so I was kind of <laughs> impartial because my sisters, they were really wise and nourishing. And so I had a very positive relationship and I didn't feel threatened by women. But I always found it very interesting that in faculty meetings and even in training meetings, that a lot of the men would really feel threatened if some woman pushed her weight around. Let's say, for example, somebody like uh, Stella Resnick. She was awesome. I mean. I met her um, when she moved down from the Bay Area. She used to date Jerry Rubin, the 60s activist, and she studied with Fritz Perls uh, personally, whereas I'm second generational. Mm -hmm. She was really first generation. But I always uh, profoundly uh, respected how smart she was and tough, and she didn't let anybody, men or women, push her around. No, she and still does not. <laughs> still does not. That's right. And I, I like that. I've always mm -hmm. liked that about her. And so um, I haven't, like the men's movement came along, but I wasn't really, I didn't need it. And I think I didn't need it because when I was 13, I joined the Boy Scouts. And so you're really in a men's movement. Mm -hmm. and, and I matriculated from uh, all the different ranks from tenderfoot all the way up to Eagle, which is the highest award in scouting. And so I was always around men, older men. And so, and they toughen you up because you can't really, in order to pass Eagle Scout, you have to go out in winter. They drive you to this place in the forest. It's snowing and you have to dig down with a shovel through the snow, find leaves and, and make fire from not matches, but from a little rock, it's called yep. flint in steel. And I was sitting there in the snow doing this. So I was toughened up. And then when I became part of this mountain climbing expedition team, uh, when I was 20, you know, I, I was around really macho guys. And so I, I don't think I've had to um, struggle with gender, uh, mm -hmm. with myself. Um, and I think I've been able to deal with uh, professionally and make m lots of space for always having and surrounding myself with really strong, um, smart, uh, tough, and intuitive women. Hmm. Okay. So, I think, go ahead. I think that's what really made my faculty really stand out is, like I said, I tended to stack it more if there were 10 slots there was always six or seven women. Sometimes there might be six men and four women, but I tended to um, have a lot of strong women around me. Hmm. Okay. So I'd like to switch in a little bit more to Gestalt. You mentioned uh, this, the Amherst group. Was that where you met Gestalt or what was sort of your first encounter? Uh, the very first con um, encounter was at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. Mm -hmm. And that was with Chris, who had uh, paraplegic, who had been studying with Fritz out mm -hmm. at Esalen. And he had gone out, I think, in 68, 69, 70. Um, and then he had gone up to Lake Kachawan uh, up in Canada and mm -hmm. had been part of that uh, the Gestalt commune up there. And so what did you get from that? What did you find there or what 
drew you in? Well, prior to uh, meeting Chris, I'd had that year with the Sullivanian analytic mm -hmm. therapist, Norm Simonson. And it was really helpful. I mean, Norm Simonson really helped me to uh, feel less depressed, uh, less anxious. When I had my first Gestalt therapy experience with Chris Palamas, I just had this whole other, it was like moving from channel two to like channel 500. Okay. It was like a lot of the analytic therapy was up here. And then after working with Chris, this other guy came to town named John Heider. And John Heider was a Gestalt therapist who studied with Fritz. And then he studied, he was one of what's called the five horsemen at Esalen. And they studied under- uh, No apocalypse? No? No apocalypse. <laughs> okay. But they, re they reeked an apocalypse in terms of how experimental they were at Esalen in what they called Gestalt therapy. Okay. But they studied with a, a guy named Wool Schutz who wrote the book Encounter. And he was a student of Fritz's also. And to fast forward, John came out to Amherst and I did um, a weekend with him of Gestalt therapy. And it just changed me from the inside out. I mean, I just felt like I'm, li I'm now listening to a language of therapy that is the language I wanna study. And this is really touching me. Um, this awareness stuff and being in the moment and the kinds of things that he could do because he was also like myself, he was interested in Buddhist meditation and chanting. And um, he was, as I was, he was interested in somatics. And we both studied with this guy, Alexander Lowen, who was the developer of bioenergetics, who you know really precedes everybody. And so I did that weekend with John Heider and I said to him, uh, where are you located? And he said, well, I have a human potential school in Mendocino. And so I went out to Sonoma State University to work on my master's and doctorates in humanistic and existential psychology. And so we, I became um, the coordinator of the speaker program, guest speaker program. And so John was one of many people that I invited to come down and to speak to the university. And I invited Ram Das, Bhagavan Das, Choyam Trumpa Rinpoche, James Fadiman from the Transpersonal Psychology Institute, Stanley Krippner, who was a parapsychologist, and on and on and on. And so we had John Heider come down. And it was at the end of my first year of the master's program. And again, I watched him work from Friday night till Sunday noon, sometimes 16 hours a day and watching people and myself go through these extraordinary transformations. And I just went, wow, this is what I wanna study. This is my language. And then when I arrived, I went from Northern California down to Southern California and I was, um, in a kundalini yoga ashram studying kundalini yoga because the teacher he was in LA and uh, we were about an hour and 15 minutes outside of LA near uh, Pomona College and this guy came and knocked on the door of the ashram and he said um, I'm at the Claremont Divinity School getting my doctorate in divinity I'm a gestalt therapist I'd like to learn kundalini yoga how about you teach me kundalini yoga and I'll come and I'll do gestalt group once a week. So I said, perfect. And his name was Dr. Hunter Beaumont, who now is in um, uh, Germany, um, in München, um, Munich, Germany. And so he started coming. And after three months of working with him, I said, well, where can I get trained in gestalt therapy? And he said, at the same institute, that I'm studying with, and that was in Los Angeles, so the Los Angeles Gestalt Therapy Institute, and I had a wonderful opportunity to uh, work very, very closely with all the trainers, but I would say the ones that most importantly touched me was Robert Resnick, who 
had a command and an understanding of process and an ability to articulate gestalt theory and phenomenology and field theory like nobody. And so I, I worked with him for many years and then he used to do these five day trainings every fall and every May with another trainer named Robert Martin. And Bob Martin, he was a gifted sculpturist and painter and gestalt therapist. And so they would do these five day residentials that I took for three or four years together while I was in the Institute. And the double polarity of, I mean, the difference between them was night and day. Yeah. But it was a fabulous difference because like Resnick, he just has this way of understanding process like nobody. He, I used to say to him, Bob, you're like a Zen Gestalt therapist. And he'd say, don't insult me, don't insult me. You know, in those days, anything Zen or it was always woo. -woo. His biggest beef was always, if you're gonna do a workshop, don't call it Gestalt and Zen. Mm -hmm. Just call it Gestalt and make Zen part of Gestalt, which is a very good point from a theoretical perspective. And then he introduced me to Bob Martin, who again said, well, look, I'd like to learn meditation and yoga. How about I supervise you once a week and you train me in Kundalini yoga and meditation and, and uh, Zen Buddhism. So I did that for several years. Um, and so those two, and then there was a third person who was really, really terrific, and that was Gary Yontef. And Gary was influential in really helping me to understand dialogue and the importance of being honest and present and purposeful in therapy and being real and having integrity and the importance of developing character. Um, and so those three um, were extremely important. And then simultaneously, I started drinking at the well of the Gestalt Therapy Institute of La Jolla with Irv Polster and Miriam Polster. And to this day, I mean, I can't say I stopped because long after I was certified in the institutes, there's a group of four of us who to this day, every year, once or twice a year, we go down to La Jolla and we spend a day with Irv Polster, who's 96, 97 now. 98. 98. <laughs> and, um, I'll, I'll address Miriam first. Mm -hmm. Miriam was just, there was just nobody like Miriam. I mean, she was just a breath of fresh air and she had an appreciation for literature and art and music. And Miriam uh, had a way of, when she worked with you, it just opened you up, but it opened you up also, opened your ears to hear differently and your eyes to see differently. Mm. And then Irv, well, I, I just have to say Irv is the wizard. He's the magician. He's, um, Irv's just extraordinary. And what's extraordinary about Irv is both his ordinariness in that he's just a really nice guy, but he has this extraordinary way when he's working. He's not thinking that he's a Gestalt therapist. He's just intuitively there. And I've seen him over the years because I also teach as he does at the Erickson uh, conferences in Phoenix and I've taught nationally and internationally. And I've watched um, Irv do demonstrations, clinical demonstrations and um, with other Ericksonian hypnotherapists and with other psychoanalytic people. And Irv is just so fluent that he can talk in all of those languages and he's able to understand and recontextualize whatever they're doing, but bring it back through to a Gestalt perspective. And so just throwing in some of those folks, I mean, there's all these other folks that I've studied with uh, also outside of Gestalt, but if you take those five, you know, Resnick, Martin, Yontif, Irv Poster, Miriam Poster, I had a great ride. Like you asked the question about privilege. 
yeah, I mean, I was really blessed to study with those masters at such a young age and then continue it. I mean, yeah, and I, I really appreciate the way that you're saying it, not as a presumption and a list of, oh, yeah, you know, been there, tick that box, I was there. I, I'm enjoying your appreciation of the people and of their work. Yeah, and to this day, I mean, if I have an issue about something, I'll email Bob Resnick and set up a supervisory consult. Mm -hmm. And like I said, he's just always on process. And then, of course, Irv is just, you know, Irv's okay. just the fountain. I mean, it's just so extraordinary. Mm -hmm. Just extraordinary in so many special ways. I mean, he's not only warm and hot felt, but he's just got, got that laser of getting you to come out of wherever you're stuck in that you don't even know you're stuck in. Mm -hmm. I mean, last time I was with him, he had me stand up on a couch and to sing to the entire group. <laughs> sure. <laughs> you can't say no. no to that, can you really? No, no, no. And it really opened me up too, because I, I was complaining that I was suffering from depression from um, some heartbreak. And 10 minutes later, he's got me singing and I'm in joy. And like, I'm, and he goes, and what about the heartbreak? <laughs> and I, you know, like you forget about where you started. Hmm. Okay. So when you said stuck, I mean, another question that I sometimes ask is about challenges. Like what, what have you run up against in, in all of this process? Well, that's where polit a little bit of politics come into play. And I don't, I think, um, it's best to not name names, but yeah, no, you could just say that was it. It was the Gestalt politics. That's yeah. yeah. In the Gestalt politics, with all my training and expertise, and being the chair of the psychology department and the director of clinical training, the LA Institute pretty much. And, and I've taught at other Gestalt therapy institutes all over the world, Japan, Australia, Canada, Europe. Um, the Gestalt politic in Los Angeles, is, I'd say it's a very close shop. And so it was very difficult and really personally painful to always not be allowed into that shop. Mm -hmm. That's hard. That's about all I have to say about that, because yeah. a closed shop is a closed shop. <laughs> and Irval says to me, if the door's closed, stop knocking. Yeah, that's a, a very wise piece of advice, I would say. Yeah, and he said, enjoy that you get to go to Japan and teach there and you get to teach all over Australia and on and on and on. But um, so. Mm -hmm. So maybe. even if that if those if those particular doors are closed, um, do you feel like you have a community that you're part of a Gestalt community? Um, yeah, yeah, because I still interact with the people mm -hmm. and refer people and they refer people to me and but is it a meaningful community for you as a person? Is that, does that phrase Gestalt community mean anything to you? I would say, and unfortunately in the LA circle, not so meaningful because okay. for example, people like Stella Resnick it is not really welcomed into that circle either. Okay. But like Stella and I, in the European Association of Gestalt Therapy, much, I feel much more uh, affinity and closeness. Mm -hmm. There's more welcoming there. Hmm. Okay. But I'm, I'm very welcomed by the Resnicks. I feel mm -hmm. very close with them and have always been respected. Okay. okay. Well, another question um, to try and get out of politics, I think, um, and more into clinical. This is, this is something I've become curious about asking people is what comes to mind as a, a clinical experience in your therapy career that you kind of went, wow, this was a remarkable moment. Yeah, um, it's very easy to, to address this one because I'll never forget it. So the second year um, of Gestalt therapy training in Los Angeles, a patient walks in and just the week before I had worked on um, a dream with Bob Resnick. And he suggested uh, in my own work to do something that he learned from Fritz Perls. 
which was to turn things around, play with polarity. So this patient came in, she had a dream and she's driving down the road and there's just a gigantic boulder in the road and she just didn't know what to do. And the lead up to it too, is that in her life, she was uh, a breast cancer survivor. She was on chemo. She was just struggling with which way is her life going to go? Is she going to live? Is she going to die? And so I, I just suggested, I said, go back into the dream, which is the Gestalt principle, redream the dream and turn the car around and continue the dream. And so she turned the car around and then she started going down a road, going away from the boulder and she found another road. So she took that road and her whole face and body lit up. And she said, it's as if I'm driving through Wyoming right now. And I can see like the Grand Tetons on my left. And I can see for hundreds of miles that everything is opening up and that everything is spacious. And she just became like overwhelmed and she was crying and tearful. And then as things in her nervous system started to settle, she said, I'm Dr. Ron, I'm going to be okay, whether I live or whether I die. Mm. The mountains, yep, I surely got to climb them. And then on the right side, I can see from the open road, that could be the end of the horizon for me, but I just feel at one whether I go left or I go right. Mm. And I was only 26 years old when I did that piece of work with her. And for years later, she'd send me these little letters every three or four years. And she'd say, you don't have to stay stalled in the car by the boulder. <laughs> it's, it's, it's always really a privilege to sort of be able to witness people having moments like that. Yeah. And you know, Ordinarily, I think, you know, I probably would have tried to gestalt, might have psychoanalytically interpreted that boulder or, you know, or had her just stay in the car and experience the impasse, but. That would have been horrible. <laughs> right, exactly. That would be horrible, right? Yeah. Maybe, I mean, maybe you go through it and you come out on the other side, but oh, yeah. Yeah, but maybe you don't, you know? Mm -hmm. And I remember Bob Resnick always suggesting, well, you can hold someone at the impasse Fritz used to do that, but you can also play with polarity. And he said, if you hold someone at the impasse, it can create a lot of frustration that's unnecessary. Why not come in with polarity and explore some opposites? Yeah, it's sort of the word choicefulness comes to mind, right? Yeah, that's right. They might not be ready to go, but they will have some options. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, so I guess really bad segue, but it, it is kind of about choice, the, the next question. And I mean, you've really touched on a lot of other things that I would normally sort of spread out in, in particular questions. So I'm, I'm wondering what's next. I mean, you certainly don't sound like you're finished. You certainly sound like you have a whole bunch of achievements, but where are you now and where are you going? And where do you think Gestalt can go from here forward? Okay, um, great question. I, I'm gonna have to answer it in layers. Pieces, yeah. In pieces. So I'm about to be 70. Three years ago, I was doing a training in Zurich, Switzerland with Peter Levine, the founder of Somatic Experiencing. And so I was uh, doing a training at the same center and he was teaching up in the mountains. And so they asked me if I wanted to go up and spend a couple of days after my training ended and hang out and sit in and audit his sure. training. So I said, yeah, sure. So I did that for a couple of summers in a row. In one summer, we were at breakfast together. And I said to him, Peter, that piece of work that you did yesterday afternoon, that just seems so easy and so simple. And he lowered his glasses. And he said, oh no, Ron, that was a very complex piece of work. 
have you taken my training? And I said, no. And he said, I think you should. I think it would really complement what you do with Gestalt and Ericksonian hypnosis and mindfulness. So a month later, I was in the somatic experiencing training in Los Angeles. And three years later, I, I graduated, got certified. And so where I am recently, I brought Matt into Gestalt work, you know, mm -hmm. the importance of tracking the nervous system, working with the polyvagal system, ventral vagal, dorsal vagal, parasympathetic, sympathetic system. So I have a deeper appreciation for using somatic experiencing as a Gestalt therapist to treat uh, shock trauma and developmental trauma. Mm -hmm. Which brings me to, well, where am I now? I still have uh, lots of ambition. However, I'm under contract to write a new book and my new book is on core creativity. And so I'm gonna try to bring a lot of Gestalt therapy and um, mindfulness principles uh, into it. And with the uh, COVID, it's the first time in I'd say 35 years, I haven't been on a plane <laughs> since <laughs> January. You've been grounded. <laughs> I've been grounded. And I was supposed to go skiing in January and then to the- uh, your, Mexico in February. Mexico in February. I broke my foot and then COVID hit. And so I found myself restricted for like the first time in my whole life. Like, I couldn't walk around with a broken foot and there's COVID, I can't go anywhere. And so I've developed a great appreciation for just being at home mm -hmm. and not doing a lot, which is a big, big shift because I've been a super overachiever. And um, now I can't wait for the vaccine because I was supposed to be in China this month doing five weeks of training, which is off the books. You're not. <laughs> not. And I have nothing, nothing, zero on to 2021. Nobody's yep. scheduling anything. No. So it's great because I get to write my book, mm -hmm. but um, I'm also learning that, okay, you know, you don't have to be on the road all the time. Yeah, lots of emptying of self and no yeah. future planning and- yeah. And in Zen, we say, if you empty the teacup, then the master in the metaphor of life, the cosmos can pour more water, you know, more wisdom and more <laughs> nourishment. Uh, so I'm, I'm really experiencing that I'm being fed and I'm letting myself be fed. Sleeping, eating right, exercising, reading, researching, writing. So it's, um, it, it's a novel time. I probably wouldn't have picked it uh, had I not broken my foot and COVID set in, but here we are and um, I'm starting to like appreciate it. Well, I mean, they tell you to go sit under the tree from four to seven in the morning, you sit under the tree, right? It That's right. So this is a sort of, uh, this is a form of sitting under the tree um, and experiencing what is, is like, it's all here. Uh, mm -hmm. There's nowhere to go and uh, you can't escape COVID. Uh, and so there's nowhere to go except to be here and to be in the moment and very gestalt and very zen and to continue to open to new experiences that are, are more with myself because I'm not really going out and about. Mm -hmm. I'm opening <laughs> to subtler qualities inside of myself that I really wasn't aware that they were really there you know, in terms of finer uh, attunements. Hmm. Okay. And what about Gestalt? What do you think is going to happen or is happening with it now and next? Well, I'm excited about two things with Gestalt. Um, the American Association of Gestalt Therapists is in a struggle to add the initial I into that. It's not the American Association. Yeah. It's the Association for the Advancement. Is that what it is? Yeah, everybody thinks that it's the American, it's not, there is no American association. You could start one. <laughs> so that's good to hear because I always thought it was the American. No. 
<laughs> you just but proved I, the point that it needs the I. That's right. So I voted two years ago to add the I to make it, why not make it international for all of us? And so I'd like to see that come to fruition. Although there's somebody named Peter, I can't think of his last name. Who's Philipson? Your, <laughs> he's huh? a sweetie. Peter Philipson? Yeah, I, I think he's having a hard time with it. Oh it's, no, he loves it. Oh, he likes, well, there's somebody. But that's okay. But it got voted, it got changed. I'm on the oh, scholarship okay. committee for the IAAGT now, so. So, fantastic. And then I'd like to see more um, dialogue between IAAGT and EAGT. Mm -hmm. Because I've spoken at the last three or four EAGTs and given workshops. And I really like what's going on in terms of making things more international and cross fertilizing. Mm -hmm what we do in America and bringing that to Europe and then what they're doing in Europe and bringing that to America. Personally, I'd like to see Gestalt therapists become a little bit more open and receptive to the somatic experiencing work um, and the work of Milton Erickson in Eric's, Ericksonian mind-body healing therapy, um, because I think that takes Gestalt to a much deeper and more expansive level. Um, but especially the, the somatic experiencing work because it addresses trauma. The methods that Peter Levine has developed are really sophisticated. And to be 66 years old, and I'm sitting in the back, and I decided in the first training to just sit on the floor. You know, I didn't want anybody to see me or to notice me and make it any kind of a big deal. And the first day went by, and yeah, it wasn't particularly moved. And then the second day, when we started working in triads, and then the third day, the theory and all of the um, neuroscience and all of the trauma theory, and then the working in triads, I started to feel like what I felt very early on in Gestalt therapy, that like, whoa, something's happening here. What it is is not exactly clear, but I'm really liking it. And then three years later, when I walked out with my certificate, I went, wow, I'm really glad I got that. And I'm really glad that at 66, I, I'm not a know-it-all, that I was able to sit with a whole bunch of 23-year-olds and 30-year-olds and 50-year-olds and really get influenced and really get uh, profoundly affected. Um, and on another level, I was just excited the fact that, yeah, I did it. I did some. I went on to do some new training that I never thought I, I would do, mm -hmm. which kind of opened up like you're never too old to learn. There's always new stuff to learn. Just get out of the way, and when something comes along and someone says, "Hey, Ron, I really think you, you get a lot of benefit out of this," you really listen to that, which mm -hmm. I did. And so last time I saw Peter Levine, we were at a faculty dinner together, and I looked over at him and I just winked and I said, I did the training, Peter. And he smiled and I smiled. And that was all that was said. There was like nothing else to say because he got that I got it. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, I would like to just end it here, if that's okay. And I really appreciate your time. <laughs> Hope to see you. Down the road. Mexico.